Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all again. Uh, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Save the Bay's Breakfast by the Bay live stream series here on Facebook every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Brought to you by 11th Hour Racing. I want to thank them very much for continuing to sponsor our live streams here. Um, again, it's nice to see all of you. My name is Captain Chris, in case you don't remember. Behind our camera today is Miss Grania, who will be uh, filming me as I talk to you about another one of our lessons that we're going to be revisiting. So it's something that I um, have talked about in the past, but anytime that we can meld science and creative arts together, I just really love it. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to kind of bring those two parts of your brain together. And also, um, I don't know if anybody's a bit of a weather nut or buff or stays up on it, but the next two days are going to be wet and cold here in the Northeast. So they're probably uh, going to be some inside activities necessary. So today is a great opportunity to learn about something you can do at home over the next two days called Gayutaku. So that's what I'll be talking about during our live stream this morning. So thank you all again for tuning in. Um, I always like to riff a little bit in the beginning there and make sure that we get people tuning in, but I'm sure we're good by now. So I am going to talk to you about a, uh, an art form called Gayutaku. All right. This is, I'd imagine, a word you haven't heard before unless you watched my lesson uh, last year about this, or maybe you are a fan of the art form of Gayutaku and you're familiar with it. Um, if you're not, we're going to learn something new today, which I love. That's how you know you had a successful day is when you've learned something new. And today is going to be Gayutaku. But before I get into it, I want to tell you, well, we'll make up a little story here to help uh, understand a little bit about what this Gayutaku is and why it was necessary. So go back, we're back in, oh, actually, forget that. Any of your summer vacations, maybe you have like a beach house or a lake house, or if you're like me, you've got an uncle that like to take you out on a boat all the time to go fishing, right? And so you're out and you're fishing, or you're on a dock, you're casting, you're out on that boat, you're on the side of the lake, and you catch a fish, or your uncle, if for me it's my uncle Bill, catches a fish, reels that fish in, and all of a sudden, after a couple minutes, you pull in a fish, and it was this big right? And then everybody at the end of the night gets together if it's that summer vacation or maybe months down the line Uncle Bill's telling the story about that fish that he caught when he was reeling it in and the fish was this big, right? And everybody oohs and ahs, yay Uncle Bill, he caught the big fish. And then a year goes by and you get back together for that summer vacation at the lake house or uh, back uh, down by the beach. And Uncle Bill inevitably takes you out fishing and starts telling you the story. You remember that time we were out and I was reeling for hours and hours and all of a sudden I pulled the fish over the side of the boat and it was this big. And you say, well, I remember that, but that fish was a little bit bigger in this story than it was last year when you caught it. And then the same thing happens next year. We all get back together for the summer vacation and Uncle Bill's talking about reeling for hours and his arms are going to fall off and he thought he caught a whale. And when he pulled the fish over the side of the boat, it was this big. And every year that Uncle Bill tells that story, the fish gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you have that in common with me, you also have that in common with fishermen in Japan in the 19th century or the 1800s. What they realized was there's a problem, that all these fishermen were telling these stories about the fish that they were catching, and every time they told their story, the fish got a little bigger and a little bigger. And so they wanted a way to document the fish that they were catching. But there was a problem. If you're out fishing as a fisherman, um, in the 1800s, you were probably either feeding your family or catching food to sell, right, in order to be able to buy things. So that was your job. And so if you catch that fish, it needs to get cut up and sold or eaten very quickly because it would go bad. And so we can't just walk around with a dead fish for days showing people because you're proud of your catch. We can't refrigerate it or we can't freeze it because there's no electricity in the 1800s. So there's no place to store it for days to show people. So we can't do that. We can't put it in a preservative like formaldehyde or alcohol like a scientist would to preserve a specimen because then we can't eat it anymore. Those are toxic, right? And so what's our option? Well, maybe we take a picture, right? So those fishermen in the 1800s would just take out an iPhone, snap a picture, and then they can eat the fish. Now, of course, they can't do that. That's silly. There was no cameras or phones back then, right? So no good way to document your catch. So what the fishermen decided they needed was a way to do that, and they came up with Gayutaku. And so what they would do is they lay their fish out, they would paint the fish in an ink, right? And then take a piece of paper, lay it on top of the fish, rub the paper all around, and when they peel it up, they would have a life-size scale painting or impression of the fish that they caught. And now they can wash the fish off, sell it, 
and they have a record of the fish that they caught. And what they created was this art form called Gayutaku. So if we break the word into two pieces, Gayo literally means fish, and Taku means impression. So what they were doing was taking an impression of the fish in order to create this painting or this piece of art. And that's how Gayutaku was born. And what's really, really cool is as these fishermen did it, over time they became better and better. And not only were they amazing fishermen, but they were amazing Gayutaku artists. And they became so good that people all around Japan, from uh, like the royal family, the imperial family, and very wealthy people, would hire these fishermen, commission them, to create Gayutaku art for their home. So not only did it remain a form of record keeping, but also it became this beautiful art form. And what I love is that today, we have lots of ways to document all of our catches. You just hold up your fish and someone can take your picture, right? Or we can put it in a fridge or a freezer if we need to. And so the idea, the reason behind Gayutaku, the reason why we need it, doesn't exist anymore. We have lots of ways to document our catch. But the art form still stays alive today. And there's a lot of people around the world that are performing this art called Gayutaku. So that's what Gayutaku is and how it was created. I want to show you what it looks like and then show you how to do some of your own at home. So Ms. Grani is going to follow me over to some uh, examples of some Gayutaku. And I just want to say that as we move along, if you have any questions or comments, you can make sure to put them um, in, the, in the comments section of the video. And uh, if I know an answer, uh, well, Ms. Grani will read some questions if there are any. And if I know an answer, I'll be able to answer it here. And if not, we'll look up something. Um, but again, my name is Chris. We're talking a little bit about Gayutaku today. And I wanted to show you two examples of some actual fish prints. So I mentioned that there's people all around the world that do, still do Gayutaku today. Um, and these are two prints that I hang in my home that are from an artist in Massachusetts on the North Shore above Boston, um, whose name is Joe Higgins. And he does some amazing work. Uh, this one right here is an example of a more uh, traditional style of print. So this is a barracuda. It's not a fish that I caught, so I'm not trying to brag about catching this. I did not catch it, I promise. But it was a real barracuda that was caught by someone in Florida. And they wanted Joe to make a fish print, a Gayutaku print of it. So they, they brought it to him, and he did a more traditional print. Typically, the prints were done in one color, which is a black ink, using a type of ink called sumi ink. And sumi ink was a non-toxic ink. Uh, but you could also, back then, use cuttlefish ink or squid ink concentrate. So you can take the ink sacs from the squid and paint them on the fish as well, right? And so Joe did use a little bit of color in this one, but this is a more traditional painting of the barracuda. And it's on a type of paper called rice paper. And Ms. Grania, if you want to get really close to this, I want to show you. So what's very cool about the rice paper, and this will make sense later, you might be able to see there's lots of little wrinkles and things in it. And that's because rice paper almost feels more like a fabric than a paper. It's very thin, kind of like a tissue paper, and it's very, very good for fish printing. And also can be very pretty. These have lots of little leaves in them and things like that. So we have the sumi ink on the fish and the rice paper that it's being impressed upon. And then another uh, print that I've got right here that's a little less traditional but still really fun is this reproduction print of a blue crab. We look all right on the glare there, Miss Grania? Mm -hmm. All right. So this is a reproduction print, but what Joe did here was uh, have a little more fun with it and get a little more creative. It's on red paper, and the artist painted the, the crab with different color ink to make it look a lot more like it would in the wild. So you can see the red on the tips of the claws, uh, which would be otherwise blue, and then lots of color in the shell. So this looks more like the crab that you would see in the wild than just black. So you can take a lot of artistic liberty or artistic freedom with your prints, whether you want a colored paper and lots of different color paint or something more traditional like this Barracuda. And so, we have a question, Captain Yeah, absolutely. Chris. Stephanie would like to know what inks do they use now to make this? Is it still non-toxic ink or do artists tend to use traditional paints now? So most of the traditional artists like Joe who are doing this type of work do get a very traditional sumi ink from Japan that uh, is a little bit more expensive but has a much better, uh, is, results in a much better product. Um, if you are able to get squid ink, like sometimes you can get squid ink at a like an Italian grocer or something like that that you would use for cooking, you can definitely use that on your paper. And then today what I'm going to be using is just a non-toxic uh, paint that I would normally be using for arts and crafts uh, because I'm not going to be worried about eating this fish right now. But very good question. Thank you, Seth. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention also that 
sometimes what artists will do that you'll see is if you know what the fish eats, like if this were a striped bass, I know that they eat squid and bunker or pogey, uh, mackerel and things like that. So if you have some of the bait fish, the fish that they eat, you can paint those and press them onto the scene to make it look more active, like the fish is actively hunting. So there's lots of things you can do to kind of make it your own and, and pretty it up a little bit. And that's what I'm gonna show you today is how to make your own Gaiutaku at home. Uh, maybe not with a big like four foot barracuda, but some supplies that you might have lying around the house or that you could really easily acquire. So if you come on over to my table here, I wanna show you what you'll need to do your own fish printing. And it may not be an actual fish, but it'll be some type of marine art. Um, so for our fish printing today, materials that we need, first of all. So um, I'm just using some eight and a half by 11 printer paper. Um, and what I would recommend, because I, I don't have the uh, beautiful rice paper, is you've got two options. Uh, you can use tissue paper if you want, which is much softer and more pliable and supple, but it does rip very easily. So if you are gonna use tissue paper, you need to be very gentle. The other thing that I would recommend that I did today seems kind of wrong, but I promise um, it'll make sense. If you have eight and a half by 11 paper, just take it and crumple it right up. You're gonna crumple it into a ball and then very gently open it back up. And you're gonna do this two or three times. And I know you're thinking, Chris, that's crazy. I wanna make a beautiful piece of art and you're already having me crumple up the paper before I even do anything. And the reason that we do this is that a lot of the things that we're going to be printing are kind of rounded in shape, right? And so a flat piece of paper doesn't work quite as well. So if I crumple this a couple times, I have a couple examples of what it looks like afterwards. So this eight and a half by 11 paper is very stiff and not flexible, but my pre-crinkled paper is very soft, right? And it looks a lot like the rice paper that is traditionally used. So by doing that a couple times, unwrinkling it and laying it out, we have uh, something similar to what would be traditionally used for the Gaiotaku art. So we have our paper, all right? We've got, today I'm just using some non-toxic, I forget if it's like acrylic paint or something like that, but just normal non-toxic paint is fine. If you wanted to use watercolors, you could definitely use that too, whatever you've got around. If you want to do a fish, the beauty about um, that is that these days, a lot of fish markets sell whole fish. So you can buy a whole sea bass or a whole scup or porgy and take it home and print it yourself. And if you do that, you just wanna make sure to rinse the fish off, pat it dry with a paper towel, and you'll be ready to go. Now, I don't have any fish with me today and I didn't wanna to go to the fish market and buy any. So what I'm gonna be using are shells. So we can do fish prints with shellfish as well. So I went to the beach and collected some shells that we can use. And the key with this, there's a couple things. You wanna make sure first that your shell is nice and big, right? It's very difficult to print a, whole, uh, a very small shell. So I've got a nice big surf clam here. Also that the shell is completely intact. I'm not missing any pieces, it's not broken, right? I want it to be a full representation of the animal. You also wanna make sure it's kind of flat. So something like this whelk snail, this big and round, won't work very well. But my clam shell is very flat and will. And then the last thing is you also wanna make sure that there's nothing really growing on your shell. So like this one, this scallop shell has a bunch of barnacles growing on it. And so that won't work very well. That won't show up on my paper and might even rip my paper. So make sure there's no barnacles or seaweed or anything like that. And if there is a little bit, all you have to do is wash it off in your sink, dry it off, and you're ready to go. So today I have a clam shell and an oyster shell. Your other options. There are some companies that sell rubber stamps that you can use that either look like a little cartoon fish or look like the real life thing. So you can make it a little more realistic. So there's some different scientific arts and crafts companies, scientific supply companies that you can buy these from. So if you are able to, and then you have a little more time, you can buy something like that. If you don't want to spend anything, I bet you have some old sponges laying around the house and you can cut out some shapes. So I cut out a little shark, a little fish and a sea star that I'll show you how to use as well. Awesome. So we have all of our materials, of course, some paintbrushes and we're ready to go. The first thing that I'm gonna do is make sure that my tablecloth is down. I don't wanna get in trouble with anybody at home because you got paint on a nice table. So make sure to lay down some um, either newspaper or a tablecloth. You can see we use this one for a lot of arts and crafts here at Save the Bay. I'm gonna paint my shell. Now when I'm doing this, if you guys have any questions, make sure to shoot them down there because it's gonna take me just a moment. Um, the key with our shells, if you're not painting a fish, if you're painting a shell, is the shell's gonna take a lot more paint than a fish will. 
And the reason for that is the shells absorb a lot of the paint. So my first pass through, what I'm gonna find is that the paint goes on and then dries very quickly. And your print won't look very good with dry paint. So I'm making my first pass around, make sure not to miss any corners, any edges or anything like that. You're getting lots of paint right in there. All right, good. Now I'm going to go over once more. And the key with this is you wanna make sure that there's no big globs in any places. So not only that you haven't missed a spot, but that you didn't go on too thick in any places. You'll know it's good because it's nice and shiny, looking kind of wet, right? But there's no big globs sticking out to you. So I am just about there. I'm gonna make one more pass. All right, trying to keep it off my hands as much as possible. I don't wanna paint my hands here and get my fish print wet. All right, now we'll give this a shot. I'm gonna lay my shell down, going to grab my crinkled paper, very gently and carefully bring that paper down so the shell is right in the middle. And then this is the tough part. Use two fingers and just hold your paper in place on your shell. You wanna make sure the paper doesn't move because if it slides around, it'll make smears or you could get like a double print or a triple print. And then with your other hand, just take two fingers and very gently rub around the paper all over all the parts of the shell. You wanna make sure you don't miss any places, right? So you're just gently rubbing around, letting this nice crinkled paper get around all of the curves and crevices, really pushing in, in some of those curvy places and remembering not to miss any of those spots. So I'm just continuing to hold that paper in place as I push down the paper on the shell. And then when I think I've got everywhere, which I think I have at this point, I'm gonna very gently, carefully peel away and you should have a little bit of an impression. Now, from the looks of it, I didn't use quite enough paint on this one as I could have, right? The beauty of it is the shell's still good and I can just paint it again and try once more, right? I made some earlier, so this one was a little better. You can see I used a little more paint on this one, but you can see all of those beautiful lines and a lot of the detail in the shell on both of them. And then if you want to, you can come in with your paintbrush you can always like add some more edges of the shell and things like that. Again, this is art, right? So you can do whatever you want it to be, whatever you want it to look like. So if you want to add some more lines and edges, it's already starting to look a little bit better, right? So that's one way to do this. That was more traditional with just the black ink. Another thing you can do is use multiple colors. Um, so something that I've done in the past as well is we'll maybe try this a little red. Uh, I guess I can use a different brush. I'm mixing all my brushes up. Put some red on my oyster shell, and this is already mixing in with a little bit of black, and that's fine. And what's great is these make great gifts. You can give to people, you can hang on your refrigerator. So right now, I'm gonna make a red oyster, and let's pretend it's Valentine's Day, and I wanted to give it as a gift to somebody on Valentine's Day. So it'll be a beautiful red oyster for Valentine's Day. So again, making sure you get that paint in every one of the little cracks and crevices, but it's not too thick in any one spot feel a little like Bob Ross here, right? All of those beautiful little cracks and crevices. All right, looks painted. Then again, just like before, my hand's a little red with paint, but that's all right right now. I'll try and be careful. I'm gonna open up my paper really gently, push down and hold it in place. Move, use my finger to rub the paper down on all of the parts of the shell, making my way all the way around. If I get a little paint on this backside, it's not a problem because no one's gonna see this part. And as I pull away, there is a little red oyster shell and you can start to see some of the ridges and things like that. And again, I could have used a little more paint on the edges, but you can always come in and fill that back in. Now, if you don't have any shells laying around the house or easy access to any shells, if you can't go to a beach or anything like that, like I mentioned, you can always cut your own fish and marine animal, aquatic animal shapes out to make your own print. So something I did earlier yesterday was draw some waves and I pressed some little fish, sharks and sea stars around. So again, it's very easy. You just get your little fish, put your paint on your fish, your sponge fish, nice and evenly around. You want to make sure it's nice and dry. If it's any, if it's wet, it won't work. So not a used or not a uh, recently used sponge. 
and then take our sponge, press right down above our shark here, and I have another beautiful fish on my painting. So lots of ways you can do gayu taco at home, whether you want to go buy a fish at the fish market and then rinse it off and eat it, that would be awesome. If you have some shells laying around the house or you can gather um, at some point, you can paint your shells or just create your own at home using some old sponges. Lots of good options for you. Awesome. Any other questions or comments or anything, Ms. Grania? Um, no, Mackenzie just says you're a real Bob Ross. Yeah. Bridget says very cool. Great. I love it so much. Well, hopefully you all find some time over the next couple of days when it's cold and wet outside. You can stay inside and do some Gayutaku arts and crafts that you can hang up around the house and have your very own fish printing. And now you know the whole story about why this beautiful art form or how this beautiful art form was created. So I really appreciate you tuning in to the, this morning's Breakfast by the Bay. And make sure to tune in next week, again, Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we only have a couple more left in our, our series here. I want to thank again 11th Hour Racing for sponsoring us. So thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.